University of Cambridge International Examinations, International General Certificate of Secondary Education, June Examination Session, 2012, English as a Second Language, Extended Tier, Listening Comprehension. Welcome to the exam. In a moment, your teacher is going to give out the question papers. When you get your paper, fill in your name, centre number and candidate number on the front page. Do not talk to anyone during the test. If you would like the recording to be louder or quieter, tell your teacher now. The recording will not be stopped while you are doing the test. Teacher, please give out the question papers, and when all the candidates are ready to start the test, please turn the recording back on. Now you are all ready, here is the test. Look at questions 1 to 6. For each question, you will hear the situation described as it is on your exam paper. You will hear each item twice. Questions 1 to 6 For questions 1 to 6, you will hear a series of short sentences. Answer each question on the line provided. Your answer should be as brief as possible. You will hear each item twice. Question 1. How should passengers reach their destinations quickly? The next southbound underground train has been cancelled. Please wait for further announcements. Or you can travel by a different route if your journey is urgent. Thank you. The next southbound underground train has been cancelled. Please wait for further announcements. Or you can travel by a different route if your journey is urgent. Thank you. Question 2. At what time must Menika leave school and why? Menika? Don't forget your dental appointment is after school today at 4.30. But I have computer club after school. That's fine, Menika. Make sure you leave at 4.20. It's a 10-minute walk to the dentist. Take your watch with you, please. I will meet you there. Menika? Don't forget your dental appointment is after school today at 4.30. But I have computer club after school. That's fine, Menika. Make sure you leave at 4.20. It's a 10-minute walk to the dentist. Take your watch with you, please. I will meet you there. Question 3. What must Thomas do before he and Yannicka can play squash? Give two details. Thomas, will you teach me to play squash, please? I've got my own racket now. OK, Yannicka. I'll book a squash court for us. But I need to buy you a special ball for beginners. Thank you. I'll look forward to that. Thomas, will you teach me to play squash, please? I've got my own racket now. OK, Yannicka. I'll book a squash court for us. But I need to buy you a special ball for beginners. Thank you. I'll look forward to that. Question 4. What will the friends receive for their £4 fee? Give two details. Hey, Mawson. Would you like to come canoeing with me? I've always wanted to learn to canoe, but where can we do that? In the open-air pool every Tuesday evening. 
They have instructors there, and it only costs four pounds each per session, including canoe hire and tuition. Hey, Mossin, would you like to come canoeing with me? I've always wanted to learn to canoe, but where can we do that? In the open air pool every Tuesday evening. They have instructors there, and it only costs four pounds each per session, including canoe hire and tuition. Question five. Give two details of the offer which Lynn hopes to use. Hello everyone, Lynn here. It's my birthday tomorrow and I'm going to book a table for 12 of us at the new pizza restaurant in the High Street. Its opening offer is two pizzas for the price of one, but only after 6.30 every day. I'll book for 7 o'clock tomorrow evening. Hope you can come. Hello everyone, Lynn here. It's my birthday tomorrow and I'm going to book a table for 12 of us at the new pizza restaurant in the High Street. Its opening offer is two pizzas for the price of one, but only after 6.30 every day. I'll book for 7 o'clock tomorrow evening. Hope you can come. Question 6. For what reason do the friends want to use the rail card? Why are they not successful? We'd like a return train ticket for four children, please, using this special rail card. You need an adult to travel with you if you use that special rail card. Oh, but it says up to four children under 16 get a 33% reduction when using this card. And we're all still 15 years old. Look at the small print too. It says, when accompanied by an adult. We'd like a return train ticket for four children, please, using this special rail card. You need an adult to travel with you if you use that special rail card. Oh, but it says up to four children under 16 get a 33% reduction when using this card. And we're all still 15 years old. Look at the small print too. It says, when accompanied by an adult. That is the last of questions 1 to 6. In a moment, you will hear question 7. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 7. Listen to the following interview about a special World Cup football tournament and then complete the details below. You will hear the interview twice. Hello and welcome to Sports Weekly. Today we have international sports commentator Arjen Smith with us in the studio. Arjen, welcome. Thank you. Sports fixtures held worldwide play a large part in our lives nowadays, don't they? Yes. We read about various World Cups and the Olympic Games and world athletic events in our newspapers. We watch the sports on TV and the internet and hear the commentaries on the radio as we drive to work in our cars. We do indeed. 
Well, I'm here today to report on a tournament with a difference. It's the Homeless World Cup. Tell us more. Did you know that there are one billion homeless people in the world? <laughs> That's a huge amount. Yes. And the Homeless World Cup exists to help stop this homelessness and to raise awareness of a basic human need, a home for everyone. <sighs> what a wonderful idea. When did this special World Cup start? The first tournament took place in Graz, in Austria, in 2003. So 2012 will be our ninth tournament. Do players from all over the world take part? Oh, yes. The first event had 18 national teams. But the Melbourne Homeless World Cup tournament in Australia in 2006 hosted 56 national teams. In that year, we added a women's tournament too. The Homeless World Cup continues to grow. Is that the idea? Yes. The World Cup gives these people the chance to represent their country and can change their lives forever as a result of the training provided. How do you prepare and train everyone? We have football trainers in 70 countries working with over 30,000 homeless people throughout the year. And does playing in the tournament change the lives of your players, do you think? Oh, yes. We know from letters and emails that over 70% of the players change their lives for the better. They sometimes even go on to become professional players and football coaches. Arjen, thank you for telling us about the Homeless World Cup. Where can we follow the tournament, please? Is it televised? It's best to follow us on the internet at www.homelessworldcup.org or listen to Sports Weekly updates. And how are the tournament and the training actually financed and supported? Through publicity and fundraising. Football clubs in many countries play and host matches to support us. We have an ambassador who is a famous footballer. And several multinational sports companies help us as sponsors. Arjen, thank you for telling us about this unique football tournament. We will look out for you all. Now you will hear the interview again. Hello and welcome to Sports Weekly. Today we have international sports commentator Arjen Smith with us in the studio. Arjen, welcome. Thank you. Sports fixtures held worldwide play a large part in our lives nowadays, don't they? Yes. We read about various World Cups and the Olympic Games and world athletic events in our newspapers. We watch the sports on TV and the internet and hear the commentaries on the radio as we drive to work in our cars. We do indeed. Well, I'm here today to report on a tournament with a difference. It's the Homeless World Cup. Tell us more. Did you know that there are one billion homeless people in the world? <laughs> That's a huge amount. Yes. And the Homeless World Cup exists to help stop this homelessness and to raise awareness of a basic human need, a home for everyone. <sighs> what a wonderful idea. When did this special World Cup start? The first tournament took place in Graz, in Austria, in 2003. So 2012 will be our ninth tournament. Do players from all over the world take part? Oh, yes. The first event had 18 national teams. 
but the Melbourne Homeless World Cup tournament in Australia in 2006 hosted 56 national teams. In that year, we added a women's tournament too. The Homeless World Cup continues to grow. Is that the idea? Yes. The World Cup gives these people the chance to represent their country and can change their lives forever as a result of the training provided. How do you prepare and train everyone? We have football trainers in 70 countries working with over 30,000 homeless people throughout the year. And does playing in the tournament change the lives of your players, do you think? Oh, yes. We know from letters and emails that over 70% of the players change their lives for the better. They sometimes even go on to become professional players and football coaches. Aryan, thank you for telling us about the Homeless World Cup. Where can we follow the tournament, please? Is it televised? It's best to follow us on the internet at www.homelessworldcup.org or listen to Sports Weekly updates. And how are the tournament and the training actually financed and supported? Through publicity and fundraising. Football clubs in many countries play and host matches to support us. We have an ambassador who is a famous footballer. And several multinational sports companies help us as sponsors. Arjen, thank you for telling us about this unique football tournament. We will look out for you all. That is the end of question 7. In a moment, you will hear question 8. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 8. Listen to the following interview about pomegranates and then complete the details below. You will hear the interview twice. Hello and welcome to You Are What You Eat, our weekly diet programme. Today we are going to discuss the benefits of an unusual fruit, the pomegranate. Expert Pfizer Moss is with us in the studio to tell us more. Thank you. I noticed that you called the pomegranate an unusual fruit. Actually, it has been around since ancient times and is now grown all over the world. Where were pomegranates first grown, Pfizer? Originally, they were grown in the area which is now modern-day Iran and Iraq. Then they were carried along the Silk Route by traders as far as China. In fact, there are still thriving pomegranate orchards in Xi'an, the old Chinese capital. Did the popularity of pomegranates stop there? No, they were then grown all around the Mediterranean, further east, and eventually in all sunny climates. Recently, Afghanistan has held a pomegranate celebration. It exported 50,000 tonnes of the fruit in 2008, rising to 80,000 tonnes in 2009, and that quantity is still increasing. You can buy the juice from the new Kabul factory in shops all around the world now, you know. Yes. That £6 million factory opened in October 2009. 
It was designed specifically to produce pomegranate juice, and very successfully too. This interest in pomegranates must be good news for the farmers. Yes, it is. Did you know that when their fruits were first exported, farmers received 34 pence per kilogram, but now they are earning over one pound per kilogram. Why is that? Is it because consumers are now more aware of the health benefits of drinking the juice? Yes. In the UK alone, the market for pomegranate juice has increased to 21 million pounds each year. The juice is lovely, but expensive. Look out for special offers. I know, I do. <laughs> I've even tried extracting my own juice, but it's not easy because of all the pomegranate seeds. That's why farmers are trying to develop a seedless variety of pomegranate, because of the demand for seedless fruit to make juice from. It is thought that fruit without seeds will become very popular with consumers worldwide. Pomegranates are prized for their wonderful health-giving properties, aren't they? The juice is meant to help prevent heart disease, isn't it? Yes. Scientists have found that pomegranate juice is high in antioxidants, which protect the body from bad chemicals in the blood. It is thought that pomegranate juice may contain three times the amount of antioxidants found in green tea. Wow! That makes pomegranates the new superfood. Now you will hear the interview again. Hello and welcome to You Are What You Eat, our weekly diet program. Today we are going to discuss the benefits of an unusual fruit, the pomegranate. Expert Pfizer Moss is with us in the studio to tell us more. Thank you. I noticed that you called the pomegranate an unusual fruit. Actually, it has been around since ancient times and is now grown all over the world. Where were pomegranates first grown, Pfizer? Originally, they were grown in the area which is now modern-day Iran and Iraq. Then they were carried along the Silk Route by traders as far as China. In fact, there are still thriving pomegranate orchards in Xi'an, the old Chinese capital. Did the popularity of pomegranates stop there? No, they were then grown all around the Mediterranean, further east, and eventually in all sunny climates. Recently, Afghanistan has held a pomegranate celebration. It exported 50,000 tonnes of the fruit in 2008, rising to 80,000 tonnes in 2009, and that quantity is still increasing. You can buy the juice from the new Kabul factory in shops all around the world now, you know. Yes, that £6 million factory opened in October 2009. It was designed specifically to produce pomegranate juice, and very successfully too. This interest in pomegranates must be good news for the farmers. Yes, it is. Did you know that when their fruits were first exported, farmers received 34 pence per kilogram, but now they are earning over one pound per kilogram? Why is that? Is it because consumers are now more aware of the health benefits of drinking the juice? Yes. In the UK alone, the market for pomegranate juice has increased to 21 million pounds each year. The juice is lovely, but expensive. Look out for special offers. I know, I do. 
I've even tried extracting my own juice, but it's not easy because of all the pomegranate seeds. That's why farmers are trying to develop a seedless variety of pomegranate, because of the demand for seedless fruit to make juice from. It is thought that fruit without seeds will become very popular with consumers worldwide. Pomegranates are prized for their wonderful health-giving properties, aren't they? The juice is meant to help prevent heart disease, isn't it? Yes. Scientists have found that pomegranate juice is high in antioxidants, which protect the body from bad chemicals in the blood. It is thought that pomegranate juice may contain three times the amount of antioxidants found in green tea. Wow! That makes pomegranates the new superfood. That is the end of question 8. In a moment, you will hear question 9. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 9. Listen to the following interview about the Nobel Peace Prize and then answer the questions below. You will hear the interview twice. Hello and welcome to our special programme today. Mrs Edith Marusa is here to talk to us about the Nobel Peace Prize. Edith. I understand you have just written a book about the history of the Nobel Peace Prize. Yes, I have. Perhaps you could tell us a little about what a Nobel Prize is. Very well. A Nobel Prize is an international award managed by the Nobel Foundation in Sweden. Since 1901, the prizes have been awarded to men and women from all corners of the world for outstanding achievements in physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and for work in peace. What does a prize consist of? Well, each prize consists of a medal, personal diploma, and a cash award. So how did the idea of a Nobel Prize originate? The man behind the prizes is Alfred Nobel. The foundations were laid in 1895, when he wrote his last will, leaving much of his wealth to the establishment of the Nobel Prizes. Who was Alfred Nobel? Alfred Nobel was born in Stockholm, Sweden, on the 21st of October, 1833. He was a chemist, an engineer, and, among other things, the inventor of dynamite. Really? I didn't know that. It's odd to think the Peace Prize was created by the person who invented dynamite. Mm. Well, tell me more about the Peace Prize. The Norwegian Parliament appoints the Nobel Committee, which selects the person or organisation to be awarded the Peace Prize. Each year, the committee invites suitably qualified people to submit nominations for the prize by February the 1st of the year in question. And there's something very unusual about these nominations. Oh, what's that? The other Nobel Prizes only recognise completed scientific or literary work, but the Nobel Peace Prize may be awarded to persons or organisations 
that are in the process of resolving conflict or creating peace. In other words, their work or project doesn't have to be complete. That is very interesting. What happens next? The committee selects the winning person or organisation and the chairman of the committee presents the prize in front of the King of Norway. The ceremony takes place on the 10th of December each year, the anniversary of Nobel's death. Where is this ceremony held? Ah, this is also very interesting. The Peace Prize is the only Nobel Prize not presented in Stockholm. The ceremony is held at the Oslo City Hall in Norway. It's followed the next day by the Nobel Peace Prize concert, which is broadcast to millions of people in over 150 countries around the world. Why is the concert held after the ceremony? The concert raises the profile of the Peace Prize. And, of course, it's a celebration. Can you tell me something about some of the Nobel Peace Prize winners? Among the prize winners are Amnesty International, the United Nations Children's Fund, Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela. Frequently, the prize has been awarded for efforts to strengthen international diplomacy and cooperation between peoples. Thank you, Edith. We have all learnt a lot from you today. Now you will hear the interview again. Hello, and welcome to our special programme today. Mrs Edith Marusa is here to talk to us about the Nobel Peace Prize. Edith, I understand you have just written a book about the history of the Nobel Peace Prize. Yes, I have. Perhaps you could tell us a little about what a Nobel Prize is. Very well. A Nobel Prize is an international award managed by the Nobel Foundation in Sweden. Since 1901, the prizes have been awarded to men and women from all corners of the world for outstanding achievements in physics, chemistry, medicine, literature and for work in peace. What does a prize consist of? Well, each prize consists of a medal, personal diploma and a cash award. So how did the idea of a Nobel Prize originate? The man behind the prizes is Alfred Nobel. The foundations were laid in 1895 when he wrote his last will, leaving much of his wealth to the establishment of the Nobel Prizes. Who was Alfred Nobel? Alfred Nobel was born in Stockholm, Sweden, on the 21st of October, 1833. He was a chemist, an engineer, and, among other things, the inventor of dynamite. Really? I didn't know that. It's odd to think the Peace Prize was created by the person who invented dynamite. Mm. Well, tell me more about the Peace Prize. The Norwegian Parliament appoints the Nobel Committee, which selects the person or organisation to be awarded the Peace Prize. Each year, the committee invites suitably qualified people to submit nominations for the prize by February the 1st of the year in question. And there's something very unusual about these nominations. Oh, what's that? The other Nobel Prizes only recognise completed scientific or literary work, but the Nobel Peace Prize may be awarded to persons or organisations that are in the process of resolving conflict or creating peace. In other words, their work or project doesn't have to be complete.
That is very interesting. What happens next? The committee selects the winning person or organization, and the chairman of the committee presents the prize in front of the King of Norway. The ceremony takes place on the 10th of December each year, the anniversary of Nobel's death. Where is this ceremony held? Ah, this is also very interesting. The Peace Prize is the only Nobel Prize not presented in Stockholm. The ceremony is held at the Oslo City Hall in Norway. It's followed the next day by the Nobel Peace Prize concert, which is broadcast to millions of people in over 150 countries around the world. Why is the concert held after the ceremony? The concert raises the profile of the Peace Prize. And, of course, it's a celebration. Can you tell me something about some of the Nobel Peace Prize winners? Among the prize winners are Amnesty International, the United Nations Children's Fund, Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela. Frequently, the prize has been awarded for efforts to strengthen international diplomacy and cooperation between peoples. Thank you, Edith. We have all learnt a lot from you today. That is the end of question 9. In a moment, you will hear question 10. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 10. Listen to the following talk about an archaeological discovery and then answer the questions below. You will hear the talk twice. Good evening. I'm Serge Herman and I'm an archaeologist. I'm here to tell you about my most recent project and new discovery. I have been working in Mexico for five years with my team of archaeologists on the trail of undiscovered dinosaur species. I have always suspected that different types of dinosaurs lived in that area of the world. Imagine my delight when, after four and a half years of digging in the spring of 2012, my team unearthed the fossilized skull of a dinosaur. The dinosaur had the longest horns ever discovered. It had to be one of the new species I'd been searching for. The horns themselves were shattered, but I estimate them each to have been up to 1.15 meters long. They are even longer than the horns of this dinosaur's cousin, which is the famous three-horned dinosaur called the Triceratops. To show it's related to Triceratops, we have put our new friend into this family as well. When we pieced the dinosaur skeleton together, we were able to estimate its weight, about five tons. It was a huge animal. The meter-long horns would have grown directly above each of the dinosaur's eyes. It would have used those horns for defence, to repel enemies or attackers, not for killing food. Our test results tell us that our new dinosaur ate plants, not animals. 
Carbon dating shows that this particular dinosaur lived approximately 72 million years ago. It lived in a swamp-like area on an island continent, which was situated between the Gulf of Mexico and the Arctic Sea, as they were positioned at that time. Scientists are currently examining our new dinosaur. And soon it will be on display in the National Museum for you to see for yourself. Do look out for it. Now you will hear the talk again. Good evening. I'm Serge Herman, and I'm an archaeologist. I'm here to tell you about my most recent project and new discovery. I have been working in Mexico for five years with my team of archaeologists on the trail of undiscovered dinosaur species. I have always suspected that different types of dinosaurs lived in that area of the world. Imagine my delight when, after four and a half years of digging in the spring of 2012, my team unearthed the fossilized skull of a dinosaur. The dinosaur had the longest horns ever discovered. It had to be one of the new species I'd been searching for. The horns themselves were shattered, but I estimate them each to have been up to 1.15 meters long. They are even longer than the horns of this dinosaur's cousin, which is the famous three-horned dinosaur called the Triceratops. To show it's related to Triceratops, we have put our new friend into this family as well. When we pieced the dinosaur skeleton together, we were able to estimate its weight, about five tons. It was a huge animal. The meter-long horns would have grown directly above each of the dinosaur's eyes. It would have used those horns for defense, to repel enemies or attackers, not for killing food. Our test results tell us that our new dinosaur ate plants, not animals. Carbon dating shows that this particular dinosaur lived approximately 72 million years ago. It lived in a swamp-like area on an island continent, which was situated between the Gulf of Mexico and the Arctic Sea, as they were positioned at that time. Scientists are currently examining our new dinosaur, and soon it will be on display in the National Museum for you to see for yourself. Do look out for it. That is the end of question 10 and of the test. In a moment, your teacher will collect your papers. Please check that you have written your name, centre number and candidate number on the front of your question paper. Remember, you must not talk until all the papers have been collected. Teacher, please collect all the papers.